where we've been very well fed. This week in our various groups, this is the uh, final meal together spiritually. Now let's pray then that this too might be a, a good banquet. And that God might again speak to us and convict us and challenge us and encourage us as he comes to us in the voice of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your living word. Thank you that this word is true, that this word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. And we want to walk farther in the path of righteousness. So we pray again this day you guide us by your word. You know our various needs, our various layers of belief and unbelief, our struggles, our doubts, our concerns, we pray again today as we see Jesus in all his glory and all his uniqueness, that you might encourage us and involve us to serve him and to make him known for his glory's sake. Amen. I was asked a few years ago to, uh, to, to speak at a cathedral in Sydney. I don't do a lot of cathedral speaking, uh, but I, I did that one. It's uh, called St Andrews. You've been to cathedrals, they're pretty formal places and formal events and all the, uh, the clergy, they call them all the ministers get all dressed up, I'm a, I'm a minister, so I, I got my gear on. Uh, if, if you've, and if you've seen the gear, it's, uh, if you have, if you have it, they with these black gowns called cassocks, these white things over them called surplices, if you're not sure what they look like, I guess the best thing would perhaps go down to the penguin parade, <laughs> uh, just, it's, it's kind of like kind of like that as we walk up the aisles, it's a bit like that. Anyway, that's what we're, so I got dressed up and, and uh, I went to wear these clerical cocks. And the service was in Sydney at 6 p.m. on George Street, which is like the Swanson Street of Sydney, a very busy street. Six o'clock was peak hour, traffic was very slow. I think my wife driving me and said, honey, just drop me at the end of the street. It's just, it's just it's a car park. I'll, I'll just walk the other half a mile. So she got me off and I began to walk up the street with my gowns over my arm and my this is the time of the height of those notorious uh, scandals of, of, of priests, mainly Catholic, but not just Catholic, who are so abusing their authority and molesting and interfering with young, young boys and girls. And I, and I walked up the street in my priestly shirt. Now, I might mean just being overly sensitive, but I kind of thought like everybody was looking at me. And ask themselves, is he one of them? Does this guy mess with kids too? I, mean, I just felt so conspicuous. In fact, after all, I just whipped the collar off and had the next shirt, I just felt under the microscope. It used to be you know, a generation ago that on a bus, you stand up for a clergyman. They had, they had such respect for them. But all these scandals done, done away with that, there's not much respect left for many of them. And, and not just clergy. But, but politicians too. I think the Vietnam War really ended our respect for politicians. Here was a war for the first time we saw on our TVs. We see the war played out live. We could see the napalm bombs, the carnage, the suffering. And, there, and, we, and we asked my generation, the people, why are we fighting in a war in what's it called? Vietnam. And where's Vietnam? Way over there. What are we doing over there, fighting, killing people over there? And frankly, we just didn't believe the government's answer. They said, oh, we're going to stop the spread of communism. Because you know, if Vietnam falls, then tomorrow it's Indonesia, then we fall next to the come. We just didn't believe them. And for us, especially for Americans, the final nail in the coffin was Watergate. We thought these guys are liars, but now, now we have proof. They called uh, Richard Nixon, his nickname was Trippy Nicky. Well, he was. He was, he was a liar. In fact, what he'd done, Trippy Nicky, amazingly, in his years in the White House, he'd made tapes of every conversation in the Oval Office, every one. And then they replayed them. And you saw the real man, who was meant to be a Christian, who was foul man and paranoid, and a liar. They just couldn't, just can't believe them. And we stopped believing them. What do we call, did you say that, our Prime Minister? Julia Gilbert, what they say? 
One day you say there's no carbon tax, now you're saying there is. And we just, one of the legacies of my generation of baby boomers we've given to you, not a great one, is a distrust in authority figures. Being in clergy or politicians, even teachers and parents. And we concluded, and I think you have, that in the end, I only trust one person. And that's me. I'll be true to myself. I can't trust those in authority. I, I can just trust me, and I'll decide what's right and wrong. Now that has for us, I think, enormous implications for gospel preaching. Because we come now to the most important questions in the world, those to do with life and death, heaven, hell, salvation. I want us to accept the authority of one man who makes a claim about himself which is, well, I think unparalleled in history, apart from madmen, unparalleled in history. Well, I want to think in this last session about probably the most controversial, and I think for non-Christians, the most offensive claim of all the claims of the Lord Jesus. But before we look at John 14, I want to think with you for a moment about humility. I, I think like you, of all the virtues, I find humility probably one of the most attractive. I find humble people very endearing. By contrast, I find proud people just unrepellable. I just find it really unattractive. Pride, don't you? My wife was talking to a guy some years ago, and she asked him uh, what he does. He, he, he said that he has his business, he contracts himself out. And he says to my wife, and, and people like to employ me. She said, I don't know really why. Oh, because they know when they get me, they're getting the equal of 10 men. Maybe she, she impressed, but not entirely. I heard about a guy recently who was just beginning to be a public speaker, developing his skills of public speaking. He was going to a meeting one night, and for the first time he asked his wife to come with him to hear him speak. Thinking she'd encourage him and be impressed, and he pulled up the work into preparing the address. He prepared it very carefully, lots of good stories. He prepared the presentation, he prepared, had the intonation rise, the fluctuation, and the rate, and the speed, and was very well prepared. Came to the meeting, he got up and went to the lecture and gave his talk. Uh, gave it very well, very well received. The hour went by like that, flew, flew the moments, and people came up at the end and shook his hands and how good it was. He was very pleased. And driving home to the car with his wife, he said to his honey, his wife, Honey, how many really great speakers do you think there are in the world? And she leaned over and touched him and said, uh, Dear, one less than you think. <laughs> I love wives. Oh, I love one, actually. <laughs> Let's get it perfectly clear. <laughs> so I, I, so I, I do find the most, I, I just find proud people unattractive. I find humble people like Gandhi, like Mandela. Like Mother Teresa, I find humble people very attractive. And I think that's why people like Jesus so much. And they do, I think, in part because he, he's so humble. People, when they think of Jesus, like him. And I, I often find no fault in him. Even I, I've never studied this love in the last 11 years. And most of why they revere Muhammad very highly can say nothing bad about Jesus. There's a story which they tell, a tradition that Muhammad told about, about the last day, the day of resurrection. People come before God for judgment, and people are scared because of their sins. And they want someone to, to go to God on their behalf, intercede for them. So they go to all the prophets, they, they go to Adam. They say to Adam, Adam, please intercede for us. Don't you see what trouble we are in? And Adam says, well, I can't intercede for you. I, I, I ate the fruit of the tree. I, I've got to worry about myself. Go to Noah. So he goes, to Noah, Noah, please intercede for us. Can't see we're in trouble? He said, I, I curse the people. I can't. I've got to pray for myself. Go to Abraham. So they go to Abraham, who says, look, I, I lied. I passed my wife off with my sister. I can't help you. And they go through all the prophets. Then they come to Jesus. And the Muslim tradition says this, 
he mentioned no sin of his. He simply said, I'm concerned with myself. Of all the prophets of Islam, only this one, do they say, really was sinless. So Christian and non-Christian alike admire Jesus enormously. His treatment of people, his courage, and I think particularly his humility. One of my colleagues at Law College said to me one time that the virtue of social humility began with Jesus. Now what it means is this, before Christ came, you always bowed yourself down before a greater one. You would lie prostrate before a god. You bowed down before a king or an emperor or a captain or a general. You always did that. But no one ever before Jesus would humble themselves before a social equal, let alone an inferior. No, we just do that now. We just do that. We open the door for someone else. We, we, we clean their room. We, we do that. All. That began with Jesus. That great event of his life, when, before he went to the cross, he, 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 he knelt down, put a towel around his waist, got a bottle of water, and did the most demeaning of jobs, and washed the feet of his disciples. It was unheard of. It was scandalous. They were at best his equals. You could say he's inferior, and he washed their feet. And then, of course, the cross. We give his life for his equals. Incredible and very, very impressive. A remarkably humble man. Now, why am I saying all this? Because our topic this morning is not Christ's humility, but his apparent arrogance. Because the one thing that gets up people's noses about Christians more than anything else, more than our perceived wowsism, is this claim that we are right and the rest of the world is wrong? That the only way to God is through Christ and to hell with the rest of the world. That just really, really angers people. One of our country leading atheists is Philip Adams, a Sydney journalist. Some years ago, he wrote an article, he writes every week in the Australia. <laughs> uh, Peter Jensen was Archbishop, and Jensen had just been pushing John Howard to be more open and welcoming of refugees. This was Adam's response in the paper about Jason. However, while giving Australians a welcome mat, a welcome shake, he seeks, to he seeks to limit access to his church and to heaven. In other words, it should be easy to get into Australia but he's not making it any easier to get through the pearly gates. Unless you have a passport stamped by Jesus Christ, you face very sentencing to somewhere else. We're told that the only way to enjoy our relationship with God, the only way to be admitted to his presence, the only way to escape damnation or something down close to it, is to accept Jesus Christ as your personal saviour. And follow the rules laid down in the New Testament. Conjure in your imagination Michelangelo's majestic painting on the Sistine ceiling of God's formidable finger approaching Adam's. Now you see that same mighty hand giving countless millions to the finger or the thumbs down. Talk about the rough end of the planet. Here's a policy that makes apartheid seem progressive. And the white Australia policy, compassionate. Here is theological genocide on an epic scale. A blanket rejection of the bulk of humanity. That's pretty, pretty strong stuff, isn't it? But not just Adam thinks that. I was speaking in a church some years ago about mission. And the past is said to be answered, so I, mean, I, I talk about calling people to go out and proclaim Christ or further lost. He said, Michael, you can't tell me that that Muslim who 
who pray is five times a day. Fast for one month a year. Gives his life savings to go to Mecca, is going to hell. That Christian who warms a pew for an hour on Sunday to go to heaven, you can't tell me that. Folk don't mind us saying, I'll oh, at least work for that. They don't mind that. They say, look, I've came to Jesus, uh -huh, it's made me happy. That's cool. Tom Cruise found Scientology. It's made him happy. It's cured as his dyslexia. That's cool, Tom. Just don't make me part of your wacky Scientology group, okay? Don't try to, and just don't try to convert me. It's cool, it works for you. Just don't try to convert me. So here we have, you see, friends, I think for our world, a great conundrum. Here we have a man, by universal admission, a man of remarkable humility. Yet making, it seems, a very arrogant claim. How do we resolve this power? So let's now turn then to that long introduction to John chapter 14. Part of our Lord's farewell address to the disciples as he faces in a few hours' time his arrest, his trial, his execution. And there's going to be a tough few days for them. He's just told Peter that Peter, in a few hours' time, and that before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. The time of suffering. He says to begin with, believe in God, believe in me, God's in control of the next few days, don't be worried. They're not sure what's happening, but it'll, 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 be, a, it'll be a trouble for them. It'll be hard. So he seeks to comfort them. With these very comforting words, verse 2, in my father's house are many, my verse says, there are many rooms, many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. Um, the old King James word there is mansions, and my father's house is many mansions. And the picture we have of, of heaven is all these big houses in heaven, like I don't know, the lodge or Kirribilli or Versailles or the White House, and there, there they are, and the Lord made these nice big mansions for us in the sky, for us to occupy. But the word simply means a house, a room, a dwelling place. The Greek word monai appears only twice in the Bible, at both times in this chapter. Here in verse 2 and in verse 23, where Jesus says to the disciples, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. Our dwelling place with him. The reason that that word mansion, in Latin the word was Mansia, which again just means a dwelling place, and the English version is mansion. So we have this picture that's got a luxurious house. It's just a room, a home, a dwelling place. And the background is a Middle Eastern home. I was in Kenya a few years ago, in Nairobi. They've got there a park for tourists, and in the park are these various replica tribal villages. So you can see how there is tribes with them. They're similar. In the center of the village is mum and dad's house. Then you've got the first son's house, and the second son's house. The third son's house, so the, the first son goes away, he gets married, comes back, and they build a little house for him and his wife. That's the picture here. I've got the son's house, a room for us to dwell in. Now what's he referring to here? We normally think he's saying, don't we? I'm going to die, rise again, and go to heaven. In heaven, I'm going to make a nice house for you. Now, I moved down in Sydney some years ago to, to teach at BCB, and they made a nice house for me. The house on campus was kind of run down, and they go with the whole thing, spent some money, and made us a nice house, and we came in Sydney and moved to our new house. And that's what you know, Jesus is doing for us in heaven. Making each other a, a nice house, he'll come back in the second coming, take us with him to our nice new homes in heaven. But that's not what he's saying. He's not speaking about heaven. He's not speaking about the age to come. He's speaking about here and now. When the Jews heard in my father's house, what would they think of? They think of the maybe the temple, the dwelling place of God. What did you say in John 2? Destroy.
destroy this temple. I am a temple. I am the dwelling place of God. You want to be in God's presence? Come to me. Want to live with God? Come to me. Want to make your home with God? Come to me. You see, what he's saying is this, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again, and by my death and resurrection, I'm going to make it possible for you to come into God's presence and the stacks of room in God's presence for all these people. Actually, the man appears really twice here in John 14, but the verb appears in John 15. John 15, verse 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. The one who remains, the one who homes, the one who dwells in me, and I in him produces much fruit. That's here and now. Here and now we enter God's presence and dwell with him. The Lord's talk about coming and going has perplexed the disciples, and they have lots of questions like, like where are you going, Jesus? And um, show us the Father. Where will you show yourself to the world? But John's the key question. Jesus, where are you going? Put out the railways. Tell us where you are. you going to Greece? To Turkey? Where are you going? He's going to the Father. And because he is the way to the Father. This is the key term here. He is the way to the Father. Because right through John's Gospel, we present the image of Jesus who is the unique Son of God. Now in a sense, all people are God's children, his offspring. And you and I are God's children by adoption. But he is the unique Son of God. Jesus never invites us with him to pray our Father. He says, you pray our Father. But he never says, with me, pray our Father. He calls God my Father, or just the Father. In fact, when, he is, when he's arisen, he says to Mary Magdalene, go to the disciples. Go tell them, I'm ascending to your God and to my God, to your Father, and to my Father. He is God's Son, we're His sons and daughters, but it's not the same thing. He is the Son from eternity. He's the Son by nature. We're sons and daughters by adoption. He's the Son by right, by right. we're sons by grace. Same Father, different relationship. He is uniquely God's Son. Only twice, you know, only twice in the Gospels does God speak. Once at our Lord's baptism, once at the Transfiguration, He says the same thing. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. This one and no one. One of the most personal things you can do is to pray. In fact, when I went to Pakistan, I had to learn Urdu. I, I could preach, okay, Urdu. I could converse. But the last thing I could do, I think, was to pray, because prayer is so personal, isn't it? It's a heartfelt thing. I remember once I was walking by a, a guy's room, and I heard the guy praying out loud. I felt like an eavesdropper, but it, it, it was very moving to hear this man pour out his heart in prayer. You find out a lot about the person when you hear them pray. Listen. Listen to Jesus pray. You find out a lot about his relationship with his Father. Listen to Jesus pray. John 17. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh so he may give eternal life to all you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you 
before the world existed. See, Jesus is the Son. He knows the Father, and He can make the Father know. He and He alone is the way to the Father. And from that follows that He is the truth and the life. John said that in the prologue. We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He brings the truth about the Father. You don't know my Father. I can't show you my Father. But you could look at me and make some guesses about my Father. You, you could conclude, well, he's male. You could conclude, probably he's Caucasian. Speaks English. He's rather tall. He's pretty good looking. <laughs> and that would be a genuine true assumption. But what, well, what my father is like, what, what pleases him, what displeases him, that, that you couldn't tell from looking at me. You can tell about God by looking at the creation. You can't you can assume by looking at there that this God is, is powerful. He's wise. A, a world of such diversity. He, 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 he's creative. He's, he's kind. But what this God is like, what, what pleases him, what makes him angry, what just carried it, you couldn't tell, you need the Son to tell you. The Son must reveal the Father. He must give you the truth about the Father, and in him is life. As he said, as he prayed, he brings life in the Father. So he says, and the conclusion is, and the right one, no one can come to the Father except, of course, through the Son. For only the Son knows him from eternity. Well, that's John 14, 6. A verse we love, a verse I think the world by and large has a problem with. But can't you see the conundrum? The great paradox is perplexing. Here's man, and then arguably, the most humble man who ever lived. A man is a model of humility. A man in his teaching and his life, so, but yet making a claim about himself, which seems arrogant. How, how do you resolve this conundrum? I think there's only one way. Only one explanation. That what the man said about himself and the Father was true. He was simply speaking the truth. Let me say, to begin with, that a claim to exclusivity isn't of itself arrogant. You might be arrogant how you do it, but the claim isn't arrogant. I've got a daughter, Laura, who's 15, uh, about eight years ago. She contracted diabetes. She takes three shots a day of insulin. She has to be vigilant to, to, to control it, and if she's not vigilant, it, it can be fatal. Now, let's say I discover a vaccine that cures diabetes. That would be a very significant development medically. I could be very arrogant about it. I could patent it and charge people thousands. I could say, I deserve the Nobel Prize. I could go around and tell myself as a, as a great discoverer, a great doctor. I could call it the rate of vaccine. I could be thoroughly obnoxious. <coughs> or I could be like most scientists, I could be fairly self-effacing. The issue is not how I behave, the issue is how have I found the vaccine? Have I made this discovery? If I have, I'm the way to cure your diabetes. If I have, I can bring you the truth about how to cure it. If I have, I can bring you a whole new quality of life. I am, in a sense, when it comes to diabetes, the way, the truth, and the life. But our Lord is speaking not here about physical illnesses, but a spiritual condition. That he is the one who's come from the Father and goes to the Father. And therefore, can take us with him. There was a Muslim some years ago who became a Christian. Yeah. And his friends were, were very angry. 
They said, why, why have you done this and turned your back on Islam? To follow this Christ. He said, suppose you were walking down a road. And the road came to a fork. And you didn't know which way to go. And by the fork were two men. One was alive. And one was dead. Which one would you ask to show you the way? Missionaries, 